Shadow Over Innsmouth by H.P. Lovecraft. During the winter of 1927 through 28, officials of the federal government made a strange and secret investigation of certain conditions in the ancient Massachusetts seaport of Innsmouth. The public first learned of it in February, when a vast series of raids and arrests occurred, followed by the deliberate burning and dynamiting under suitable precautions of an enormous number of crumbling, worm-eaten, and supposedly empty houses along the abandoned waterfront. Uninquiring souls let this occurrence pass as one of the major clashes in a spasmodic war on liquor. Keener news followers, however, wondered at the prodigious number of arrests, the abnormally large force of men used in making them, and the secrecy surrounding the disposal of the prisoners. No trials or even definite charges were reported, nor were any of the captives seen thereafter in the regular jails of the nation. There were vague statements about disease in concentration camps, and later about dispersal in various naval and military prisons but nothing positive ever developed. Innsmouth itself was left almost depopulated, and is even now only beginning to show signs of a sluggishly revived existence. Complaints from many liberal organizations were meant with long, confidential discussions, and representatives were taken on trips to certain camps and prisons. As a result, these societies became surprisingly passive and reticent. Newspaper men were harder to manage, but seemed largely to cooperate with the government in the end. Only one paper, a tabloid, always discounted because of its wild policy, mentioned the deep-diving submarine that discharged torpedoes downward in the marine abyss just beyond Devil Reef. That item, gathered by chance in a haunt of sailors, seemed indeed rather far-fetched, since the low, black reefs lie a full mile and a half out from Innsmouth Harbor. People around the country and in the nearby towns muttered a great deal among themselves, but said very little to the outer world. They had talked about dying in half-deserted Innsmouth for nearly a century, and nothing new could be wilder or more hideous than what they had whispered and hinted years before. Many things had taught them secretiveness, and there was now no need to exert pressure on them. Besides, they really knew very little— Four wide salt marshes, desolate and unpeopled, keep neighbors off from Innsmouth on the landward side. But at last I am going to defy the ban on speech about this thing. Results, I am certain, are so thorough that no public harm save a shock of repulsion could ever accrue from hinting of what was found by those horrified raiders at Innsmouth. Besides, what was found might possibly have more than one explanation. I do not know just how much of the whole tale has been told even to me, and I have many reasons for not wishing to probe deeper, for my contact with this affair has been closer than that of any other layman, and I have carried away impressions which are yet to drive me to drastic measures. It was I who fled frantically out of Innsmouth in the early morning hours of July 16, 1927, and whose frightened appeals for government inquiry and action brought on the whole reported episode. I was willing enough to stay mute while the affair was fresh and uncertain, but now that it is an old story, with public interest and curiosity gone, I have an odd craving to whisper about those few frightful hours in that ill-rumored and evilly shadowed seaport of death and blasphemous abnormality. The mere telling helps me to restore confidence in my own faculties, to reassure myself that I was not simply the first to succumb to a contagious nightmare hallucination. It helps me, too, in making up my mind regarding a certain terrible step which lies ahead of me. I never heard of Innsmouth till the day before I saw it for the first and, so far, last time. I was celebrating my coming of age by a tour of New England, sightseeing, antiquarian, and genealogical, and had planned to go directly from ancient Newburyport to Arkham, whence my mother's family was derived. I had no car, but was traveling by train, trolley, and motor coach, always seeking the cheapest possible route. In Newburyport, they told me that the steam train was the thing to take to Arkham, 
and it was only at the station ticket office when I demurred at the high fare that I learned about Innsmouth. The stout, shrewd-faced agent, whose speech showed him to be no local man, seemed sympathetic towards my efforts at economy and made a suggestion that none of my other informants had offered. You could take that old bus, I suppose, he said with a certain hesitation, but I ain't thought much of hereabouts. It goes through Innsmouth. You may have heard about that, and so the people don't like it. Run by an Innsmouth feller, Joe Sargent, but never gets any custom from here or Arkham either, I guess. Wonder it keeps running at all. I suppose it's cheap enough, but I never see more than two or three people in it. Nobody but those Innsmouth folks. Leaves the square, front of Ham's drugstore, at 10 a.m., 7 p.m., unless they've changed lately. Looks like a terrible rail trap. I've never been on it. That was the first I ever heard of Shadowed Innsmouth. Any reference to a town not shown on common maps or listed in recent guidebooks would have interested me, and the agent's odd manner of illusion roused something like real curiosity. A town able to inspire such dislike in its neighbors, I thought, must be at least rather unusual and worthy of a tourist's attention. If it came before Arkham, I would stop off there, and so I asked the agent to tell me something about it. He was very deliberate and spoke with an air of feeling slightly superior to what he said. Ensmith? Oh, it's a queer kind of town at the mouth of the Minoxit. Used to be almost a city, quite a port before the War of 1812, but all gone to pieces in the last hundred years or so. No railroad now. B&M never went through and the branch line from Raleigh was given up years ago. More empty houses than there are people, I guess, and no business to speak of except fishing and lobstering. Everybody trades mostly here and in Arkham or Ipswich. Once they had quite a few mills, but nothing's left except one gold refinery running on the leanest kind of part-time. That refinery, though, used to be a big thing. An old man Marsh who owns it must be richer than Croesus. Queer old duck, though and sticks mighty close to his home. He's supposed to have developed some skin disease or deformity late in life that makes him keep out of sight. Grandson of Cat Bed Marsh, who founded the business. His mother seems to be in some kind of foreigner. They say a South Sea Islander, so everybody raised Cain when he married an Ipswich girl 50 years ago. They always do that about Innsmouth people, and folks here and hereabouts always try to cover up any Innsmouth blood they have in them. But Marsh's children and grandchildren look just like everybody else so far as I can see. I've had them pointed out to me here. Though, come to think of it, the elder children don't seem to be around lately. Never saw the old man. And why is everybody so down on N. Smith? Well, young fella, you mustn't take too much stock in what people around here say. They're odd to get started, but once they get started, they never let up. They've been telling things about N. Smith whispering them mostly, for the last hundred years, I guess, and I gather them more scared than anything else. Some of these stories will make you laugh, about old Cat Marsh driving bargains with the devil and bringing imps out of hell to live in Innsmouth, or about some kind of devil worship and awful sacrifices in some place near the wharves that people stumbled on around 1845 or thereabouts. But where I come from, <laughs> that kind of story don't go down with me. You ought to hear, though, what some of the old timers tell about the Black Reef off the coast. Devil Reef, they call it. It's well above water a good part of the time. Never much below it. But at that, you could hardly call it an island. The story is that there's a whole legion of devils seen sometimes on that reef. Sprawled about, or darting in and out of some kind of caves near the top. It's a rugged, uneven thing, a good bit over a mile out. And toward the end of shipping days, sailors used to make big detours just to avoid it. That is, sailors that didn't hail from Ensmith. One of the things they had against old Cat Marsh was that he was supposed to land on it sometimes at night, when the tide was right. Maybe he did, for I dare say the rock formation was interesting, and it's just barely possible he was looking for pirate loot, or maybe finding it. But there was talk of his dealing with demons there. Fact is, I guess on the whole, it was really the captain that gave that bad reputation to the reef. 
That was before the big epidemic of 1846, when over half the folks in Innsmouth was carried off. I never did quite figure out what the trouble was, but it was probably some kind of foreign disease brought from China or somewhere by the shipping. It surely was bad enough. There was riots over it, and all sorts of ghastly doings that I don't believe ever got outside of town, and it left the place in an awful shape. Never came back. There can't be more than 300, 400 people living there now. But the real thing behind the way folks feel is simply race prejudice. And I don't say I'm blaming those that hold it. I hate those Innsmouth folks myself, and I wouldn't care to go to their town. I suppose you know, though I can see you're a westerner by your talk, what a lot of our New England ships used to have to do with queer ports in Africa, Asia, the South Seas, and everywhere else, and what kind of queer kinds of people they sometimes brought back with them. You've probably heard about the sailor man that came home with a Chinese wife, and maybe you know there's still a bunch of Fiji Islanders somewhere around Cape Cod. Well, there must be something like that back of the Innsmouth people. The place always was badly cut off from the rest of the country by marshes and creeks, and we can't be sure of the ins and outs of the matter. But it's pretty clear that old Cap Marsh must have brought home some odd specimens when he had all three of his ships in commission back in the 20s and 30s. There certainly is a strange kind of streak in the Innsmouth folks today. I don't know how to explain it, but it sort of makes you crawl. You'll notice a little in Sergeant if you take his bus. Some of them have queer narrow heads with flat noses and bulgy, starey eyes that never seem to shut, and their skin ain't quite right. Rough and scabby, and the sides of their neck are all shriveled or creased up. Get bald, too. Very young. The older fellows look the worst. Fact is, I don't believe I've ever seen a very old chap of that kind. Guess they must die of looking in the glass. Animals hate them. They used to have lots of horse trouble before autos came in. Nobody around here in Arkham or Ipswich will have anything to do with them, and they act kind of offish themselves when they come to town or when anyone tries to fish on their grounds. Queer how the fish always thick off in Smith Harbor when there ain't any anywhere else around, but just try to fish there yourself and see how the folks chase you off. These people used to come here on the railroad, walking and taking the train at Rowley after the branch was dropped. But now, they use that bus. Yep, yeah, there's a hotel in Innsmouth, called the Gilman House, but I don't believe it can amount to much. I wouldn't advise you to try it. Better stay here and take the ten o'clock bus tomorrow. Then you can get the evening bus there for Arkham at eight o'clock. There was a factory inspector who stopped at the Gilman a couple years ago, and he had a lot of unpleasant hints about the place. Seems they got a queer crowd there. For this fella heard voices in other rooms, though most of them was empty. That gave him the shivers. It was foreign talk, he thought, but he said the bad thing about it was the kind of voice that sometimes spoke. It sounded so unnatural, slopping like, he said, that he didn't dare undress and go to sleep. Just waited up and lit out the first thing in the morning. The talk went on most all night. This fella, Casey his name was, had a lot to say about how the Innsmith folk watched him and seemed kind of on guard. He found the marsh refinery a queer place. It's an old mill on the lower falls of the Minuxet. What he said tallied up with what I'd heard. Books in bad shape and no clear account of any kind of dealings. You know it's always been kind of a mystery where the marshes get the gold they refine. They've never seemed to do much buying in that line, but years ago they shipped out an enormous lot of ingots. Used to be talk a queer kind of jewelry that the sailors and refinery men sometimes sold on the sly, or that was once or twice seen on some of the marsh women's folks. People allowed maybe old Cap Mobed traded for it in some heathen port, especially since he was always ordering stacks of glass beads and trinkets such as seafaring men used to get for native trade. Others thought, and still think, he'd found an old pirate cache out on Devil Reef. But here's the funny thing. The old captain's been dead these sixty years, and there ain't been a good-sized ship out of the place since the Civil War. But just the same, the marshes still keep on buying a few of those native trade things. Mostly glass and rubber goo they tell me. Heh, maybe the Innsmith folk like the look of themselves. 
God knows they've gotten to be about as bad as South Sea cannibals and Guinea savages. That plague of 46 must have taken off the best blood in the place. Anyway, they're a doubtful lot now, and the marshes and the other rich folks are as bad as any. As I told you, there probably ain't more than 400 people in the whole town in spite of all the streets they say there are. I guess they're what they call white trash down south, lawless and sly and full of secret doings. They get a lot of fish and lobsters and do exporting by truck. Queer how fish swarm right there and nowhere else. Nobody can ever keep track of these people, and state school officials and consensus men have a devil of a time. You can bet that prying strangers ain't welcome around Innsmouth. I've heard personally of more than one business or government man that disappeared there, and there's loose talk of one who went crazy and is out at Danvers now. They must have fixed up some awful scare for that fella. That's why I wouldn't go at night if I was you. I've never been there and I've no wish to go. But I guess a day trip couldn't hurt you. Even though the people hereabouts will advise you not to make it. If you're just sightseeing and looking for old time stuff. <laughs> Innsmouth ought to be quite a place for you. And so I spent part of that evening at the Newburyport Public Library. Looking up data about Innsmouth. When I had tried to question the natives in the shops, the lunchroom, the garages, and the fire station, I had found them harder to get started than the ticket agent had predicted, and realized that I could not spare the time to overcome their first instinctive reticences. They had a kind of obscure suspiciousness as if there was something amiss about anyone too interested in Innsmouth. At the YMCA where I was stopping, the clerk merely discouraged my going to such a dismal, decadent place, and the people at the library showed much the same attitude. Clearly in the eyes of the educated, Innsmouth was merely an exaggerated case of civic degeneration. The Essex County histories on the library shelves had very little to say, except that the town was founded in 1643 noted for shipbuilding before the Revolution, a seat of great marine prosperity in the early 19th century, and later, a minor factory center using the Minuxet as power. The epidemic and riots of 1846 were very sparsely treated, as if they formed a discredit to the county. References to decline were few, though the significance of the later record was unmistakable. After the Civil War, all the industrial life was confined to the Marsh Refining Company, and the marketing of gold ingots formed the only remaining bit of major commerce set aside from the eternal fishing. That fishing paid less and less as the price of the commodity fell, and large-scale corporations offered competition. But there was never a dearth of fish around Innsmouth Harbor. Foreigners seldom settled there, and there was some discreetly veiled evidence that a number of Poles and Portuguese who had tried it had been scattered in a peculiarly drastic fashion. Most interesting of all was a glancing reference to the strange jewelry vaguely associated with Innsmouth. It had evidently impressed the whole countryside more than a little, for mention was made of a specimen in the University of Miskatonic at Arkham, and in the display room of the Newburyport Historical Society, the fragmentary descriptions of these things were bald and prosaic, but they hinted to me an undercurrent of persistent strangeness. Something about them seemed so odd and provocative that I could not put them out of my mind, and despite the relative lateness of the hour, I resolved to see the local sample, said to be a large, queerly proportioned thing evidently meant for a tiara, if it could possibly be arranged. The librarian gave me a note of introduction to the curator of the society, a Miss Anna Tilton, who lived nearby and after a brief explanation that ancient gentlewoman was kind enough to pilot me into the closed building, since the hour was not outrageously late. The collection was a notable one indeed, but in my present mood I had eyes for nothing but the bizarre object which glistened in a corner cupboard under the electric lights. It took no excessiveness to beauty to make me literally gasp at the strange, unearthly splendor of the alien, opulent fantasy that rested there on a purple velvet cushion. Even now I can hardly describe what I saw, though it was clearly enough a sort of tiara, as the description had said. It was tall in front, and with a very large and 
curiously irregular periphery, as if designed for a head of almost freakishly elliptical outline. The material seemed to be predominantly gold, though a weird, lighter lustreness hinted at some strange alloy with an equally beautiful and scarcely identifiable metal. Its condition was almost perfect, and one could have spent hours in studying the striking and puzzling untraditional designs, some simply geometric and some plainly marine, chased or molded in high relief on its surfaces with a craftsmanship of incredible skill and grace. The longer I looked, the more the thing fascinated me, and in this fascination there was a curiously disturbing element hardly to be classified or accounted for. At first I decided that it was the queer, otherworldly quality of the art which made me uneasy. All other art objects I had ever seen either belonged to some known racial or national stream, or else were consciously modernistic defiances of every recognized stream. This tiara was neither. It clearly belonged to some subtle technique of infinite maturity and perfection, yet that technique was utterly remote from any, eastern or western, ancient or modern, which I had ever heard of or seen exemplified. It was as if the workmanship were that of another planet. However, I soon saw that my uneasiness had a second and perhaps equally potent source residing in the pictorial and mathematical suggestions of the strange designs. The patterns all hinted of remote secrets and unimaginable abysses in time and space, and the monotonously aquatic nature of the reliefs became almost sinister. Among these reliefs were fabulous monsters of abhorrent grotesqueness and malignity, half ichthic and half Petrachian in suggestion which one could not dissociate from a certain haunting and uncomfortable sense of pseudo-memory, as if they called up some image from deep cells and tissues whose retentive functions are wholly primal and awesomely ancestral. At times I fancied that every contour of these blasphemous fish frogs was overflowing with the ultimate quintessence of unknown and inhuman evil. In odd contrast to the tiara's aspect was its brief and prosy history as related by Miss Tilton, It had been pawned for a ridiculous sum of money at a shop in State Street in 1873 by a drunken Innsmouth man shortly afterward killed in a brawl. The society had acquired it directly from the pawnbroker, at once giving it a display worthy of its quality. It was labeled as of probable East Indian or Indo-Chinese provenance, though the attribution was frankly tentative. Miss Tilton comparing all possible hypotheses regarding its origin and its presence in New England, was inclined to believe that it formed part of some exotic pirate horde discovered by old Captain Obed Marsh. This view was surely not weakened by the insistent offers of purchase at a high price which the Marshes began to make as soon as they knew of its presence, and which they repeated to this day despite the society's unvarying determination not to sell. As the good lady showed me out of the building, She made it clear that the pirate theory of the Marsh fortune was a popular one among the intelligent people of the region. Her own attitude toward shadowed Innsmouth, which she had never seen, was one of disgust at a community slipping far down the cultural scale, and she assured me that the rumors of devil worship were partly justified by a peculiar secret cult which had gained force there and had engulfed all the orthodox churches. It was called, she said, the esoteric order of Dagon, and was undoubtedly a debased, quasi-pagan thing imported from the East a century before, at a time when the Innsmouth fisheries seemed to be going barren. Its persistence among a simple people was quite natural in view of the sudden and permanent return of abundantly fine fishing, and it soon came to be the greatest influence on the town, replacing Freemasonry altogether and taking up headquarters in the old Masonic Hall on New Church Green. All this, to the pious Miss Tilton, formed an excellent reason for shunning the ancient town of decay and desolation. But to me, it was merely a fresh incentive. To my architectural and historical anticipations was now added an acute anthropological zeal, and I could scarcely sleep in my small room at the Y as the night wore away.